Hi everybody, uh, today is World Poetry Day and to celebrate at home stage we've teamed up with three different poets who've kindly recorded a selection of their poetry for us to share. Um, so World Poetry Day happens every year on the 21st of March. It began in 1999 and was established by UNESCO during its 30th General Conference which was held in Paris. Um, the aim of World Poetry Day is to connect people between and within cultures um, and across the world using the creative function of poetry. So we've made it our mission to work alongside the United Nations aim of supporting linguistic diversity and especially enabling a platform for endangered languages to be heard. So World Poetry Day also encourages a return to the oral tradition of poetry recitals, which is why we've collected these recordings of the poems being read aloud, as we think that poetry is never better than when it's spoken. Um, and then another large part of World Poetry Day is to reassert the importance of the art of poetry um, and to rid it of the perception of being outdated. I think that our three speakers provide very fresh new voices and I believe they show there's a vibrant future for poetry yet. So I really hope that these poets leave you feeling like you've learned something new or perhaps just leave you feeling inspired and curious about poetry um, and hopefully a bit more connected with the worldwide poetry community. So our first poet is Sophie Herxheimer, um, an artist and poet who's held teaching posts at the Poetry School, Central St Martins, the Winchester School of Art and the Royal Drawing School. Uh, Sophie will explain a bit more herself, but she'll be reading from her 2017 publication Velkom to Inklant, uh, which is a collection of 30 phonetic English poems written in the voice of her German-Jewish grandmother, Liesel. Um, Liesel and Liesel's husband were saved by the Council for Academic Refugees and moved to Britain in 1938. Um, Sophie's received rave reviews for Welcome to England from the likes of Michael Rosen, The Observer and BBC Arts, to name just a few. Um, so I really hope that you enjoy her poetry. Hello, I'm Sophie Herxheimer. I'm a painter and a poet. Behind me is one of my paintings. And today I'm going to read you some poems from a book published in 2017 that I wrote in the borrowed accent of my German Jewish grandmother whose name I've changed for the purposes of this book, but it contains stories, true and untrue, uh, fictionalised versions of her life, all told from a kitchen that I knew very well as a small child and actually knew all the way up until the death of my grandfather in the mid eighties. But for some reason, my grandmother was a very spectacular, ordinary person who made her own ordinariness into a kind of refuge which bearing in mind I had quite a crazy and exciting family, she was rather unusual in that family. Um, myself and my sister, I think, used to really enjoy hanging out with her. And so I've always, she's always been with me as a sort of figure in my imagination. Here are some of the objects of hers that I remember and that I've cut out of black paper to accompany the poems in the book. The poems, vary some of them are really like basic lists of of things like the infantry on the left which just documents all the different things you'd need to bring with you if you were coming to a new country and others are much more narrative so there's a there's a kind of many elements there's a sewing machine that's where she talks about sewing her own creative practice i guess you'd call it nowadays well she made a lot of creative things, lots of cooking, lots of sewing, very housewifely. And I'll read you some of the poems from this book and I'll try and read in English, which is the language that I've made up, I try, tried to make up a consistent alphabet for, a language that was all around me in the streets of London growing up and which I enjoy the sort of music of in my memory. I enjoy all the languages that I hear flittering past my ears as I walk around my area of London, which is Brixton. You can imagine what a multiplicity of voices and languages and accents and phrases and idioms I am lucky enough to enjoy, especially when we're not in lockdown. So um, I'll show you as I read the poems what they look like so that you can enjoy the phonetic effect. And I'll start with the first poem in the book, which I often start with, 
because this is based on a true story that my grandmother told me. It's called London. Not so many days since we're arriving. This grey is like Berlin. The same grey day we have. This northern weather on the damp street. A bit of rain won't hurt. We'll have the trees on this Hampstead Heath we see in fact. Why should I mind that? I drive with the buses. Her conductor asking me, for what? I don't exactly remember. Fast, please. To him, my penny I hand over. He nods with a kind smile. Thanks, love, he says. Oh, I am his love. Turns handle on machine, out curls the ticket. This is when I know that here to settle is okay. The city will be home. Where even on the bus is love. This was a true story. She told me that she was so surprised when the bus conductor called her love. Um, she was very excited about that. And when she went into the haberdashery shop to get some buttons to um, sew onto the cardigan that she was knitting, the lady in the haberdashery shop behind the counter said, how many buttons would you like, love? And she thought, oh my goodness, she loves me as well. And she decided, I think, to take all the love that she encountered in London literally and it helped her to feel a bit loved and when you see she had rather a bossy bully of a husband uh, my grandfather and this poem is called Merich. He is twice the size of a normal person. I am half the size of a normal person. This is our ridiculous arrangement. I'm the mouse that cooks and cleans. He is the roaring elephant who must research the intricacy of the body on the correct medicine to administer. He plays on the gramophone, that awful pounding Bruckner. I serve up my famous pork loin baked in the oven with onion. He plays chess with our son. I dance sweaters with our daughter. We value the intellect of the tittle tattle. He likes to work and go to bed with other women. I like the parks to walk and do the garden. The children read, do sums, pass the exams. Who are we? We are just normal people. Two of the pork-eating Jews of old England. And then, um, moving on, I thought actually I'd give her a lover of her own because I felt quite that she might have had one and also wouldn't it be fun to give her one late in life after her death. So... I've written a couple of poems about these spurious, invented lovers. Some Think I Never Mentioned is the title of one of them. I'll read it to you. I never read this one. But, well, make a change, hey? Some Think I Never Mentioned. What was it? A thirst for kindness? This quality that hadn't been on offer. We had a different set of things we searched for in a husband. To find a clever man with a well-paid job was top of the list. But that was before the world went mad and long before the days of feelings. Feelings are romantic rubbish. Some things that the younger people have. They've gone beyond the basic quest for best survival, reproduction. I've seen the trouble feelings cause. Ridiculous! A too exciting Wurlitzer. How could it be okay to dabble with material so dangerous? My God! A nice man that I see starts up with talking to me at an exhibition. Asks me, what do I think of the works? He asks me, my response is mine. We both absorb, relish the silent hum of colour. Zest of the expressive line, the wit of Paul Clay, Pablo Picasso. We contemplating, we take a cup of tea, like always in this land. He won't know what I think. Amazing. He listens, turns first into a friend, and then, well, then a lover. We go to concerts at the Wigmore Hall, 
He cooks for us a shepherd's pie at his. This numbs me to my husband's harshness, his endless infidelities. Spring rips my garden green, buds burst out like shiny paint. Art and nature, feelings growing medley everywhere, till they take and over what a calamity. I sit in the demented shrubs and laugh. So there you go. And then another thing that I decided to um, mend in a kind of retrospective afterlife kind of way was my grandmother's relationship with my own mother. Now, my own mother and my grandmother respected each other up to a point, but they weren't natural friends because my mother was a wild person who was more inclined to be subversive and rebellious and and kind of a little bit of a maniac. And she did not behave herself. And my grandmother was very keen to try to behave herself and to behave like a responsible member of the family. So I think that they probably, yeah, my mum respected my her husband's mother, but not so much the other way around, especially since my mother went off with other men and divorced my dad and left my dad in a bit of a state. So I decided that they could get on once they were both dead and my mum died and I thought, well, let's put her in an imaginary space with this granny. So this one's called Heaven. Heaven. What can a mother say regarding whether the choice of her son's bride is wise? This girl was obviously a great mistake. She has all over her written in the red lip paint, trouble. But he will go ahead. And truth telling, now that both of us, that woman and myself, are actually dead, well, we get on okay. We discuss the plants. And of course, the children. My granddaughters would come and stay the night in Edgefair. They love to pick my pink and yellow raspberries also blooms for, from the garden for their mutti. They love to hide under the poof cloudy continental quilt. Those were days before Englishers had even heard the word duvet. When they made to me a visit, I let them take with them home a trinket from my glass-fronted cabinet, whatever they like. A Russian egg, carved angel, doll's house, zupchum, me and that mother shake our heads when we see my son, her former husband, still cracking his terrible jokes. And we nudge each other when we see the girls, and their girls too, happily bustling on the ordinary jobs. It turns out we also love to do rolling pastry, making presents, wrapping them with just the right scrap of shiny ribbon. In heaven, we can both smoke fags and listen to Bach shares a joy in snowdrops. So much joy in those. Right, so you've heard some of these poems. You've seen how they're spelt. Maybe there's time for one more. And I don't know if you want any more explanations, but just to give you a little bit more of the history, um, like a lot of people who came to England and it went all over the world um, to get away from fascism in Germany and in Italy and probably in other places. Then there were there were ways to get out and it was quite difficult obviously and many many people as we know did not including some of my relatives and when I was writing this book I did go and talk to a cousin of mine who still lives in North London, I live in South London. And she told me a bit about her parents and her mother, Maria Voller, was helped to escape by my grandparents who'd got here already. And her father, who was the brother, one of the brothers of my granny, he also helped, was helped to get out of Germany by, a little bit by the, by my grandparents. Um, but. Maria Voller's siblings all perished and her parents. It was a very difficult and awful story for that family. 
and I wrote a poem to try and restore those two brothers of my granny's because they were kind of not people I actually knew because they both died young-ish, like in about 1960 when they were in their late 50s. And so I decided to write them a Kaddish, which is the Jewish prayer for the dead. There's no Hebrew in it. I grew up without any Hebrew or Jewish culture, really, apart from I grew up with the sort of secular Jewish culture about food and psychotherapy, shall we say. So this is a Kaddish for the twins. They share the love for photography. But in our grand house in Leipzig, they share a dark room. They used to it before. They share a dark room. In which one of them develops into witty Ernst, and other, floating in same chemicals, emerges slowly, opens eyes, is little Gustav. They grow always stark in contrast, never taking turns with tall or short, clever or not so bright. Mutti has them both baptized, so they can qualify for singing in Bach's exquisite church in town, but everybody knows. The world in 1939 is black and white. Ernst gets to France, Gustav, broken, writes. We find him way to England. Ernst marries with a vrai Française, discovers undiscovered orchids, plays the flute, fathers five, reads Dostoevsky, works with colleagues in laboratory, whilst Gustav must join troops in Orkney. After war, he changes name to Bob, gets job as sales rep in Schmutter business. A modest flat he rents in shadows of South London with his quite religious wife. See her aspirational jacket with large shoulder pads, her despairing smile, her pride in their one child, her seven siblings and her parents perished. In 1961, and still in black and white, almost within one shutter click, Ernst in Paris, Gustav in London, fall to the ground. Twin heart attacks. No room is dark enough for such a picture. We have no prayer, but this assimilated tea or gardening. Gustav's widow so recites Kaddish, begins to look the clever one, holding on to something more than fragile reason. Brittle photographs. So I think that takes me up to my 15 minutes. I'll show you some more paper cuts just to finish. Um, I wasn't going to do any pictures for this book, but the publishers felt it would be a shame to not have pictures. So every now and again, one has a double page spread of things that belong to my grandmother, but would belong to any grandmother of the 20th century, I think. And I enjoyed kind of going into her house in my memory and, you know, feeling my way around the furniture Luckily, I've inherited some of the things like this coffee set and I could actually cut it out of paper from life by just observing it. Even this sideboard I, I own, which they bought this very heavy sideboard from Germany when they came. And um, I guess one of the things that's quite a nice thing to show you is the kitchen sink, because when I went into her kitchen, in my imagination, I was really touched to find that it was all still there and in exactly the same kind of condition that I'd left it in when I'd last seen her washing up there. Even she was still there washing up with her little tea towels and her, her sighing. Anyway, wishing you a very happy World Poetry Day and yeah, a great spring. Our next speaker is Katrina Neeklerken, who is a critic, lecturer and poet, and she writes in the Irish language. Um, Irish is the national and first official language of the Republic of Ireland and is an official language of the European Union. Um, 
Irish was the first language in Ireland until the late 18th century, after which time English was adopted for the most part, but it's still spoken as a first language by some people. Um, Katrina has recorded a selection of poetry from her collection, The Talk of the Town, um, which uses, it has some new poetry in it and also uses poetry from two of her previous collections, which she wrote in the Irish language. So she will be reading her poetry first in Irish and then again in the English translation. I hope you enjoy. Hi, um, my name is Katrina Niklarkin and I'm an Irish language poet and lecturer working in Dublin City University. This uh, last year, I launched my book, The Talk of the Town, uh, with poems in Irish and translations by Peter Fallon. Um, and I'd like to read you a few poems from this collection. Um, I was delighted that this is my third collection and I was delighted to have my poems in the Irish language translated into English so that I'd reach a wider audience. Um, just to kind of explain why I write in Irish, it's because of my love uh, for the rhythms of Irish that I find it much easier to express my emotions through Irish and um, that I'm trying to very often reconnect maybe with the past in some of my poems and the, the Irish literary traditions. So I will read three or four poems with translations and perhaps I will start with uh, Tully Lake, which is a story from one of our, um, my native place names here. And the story goes that the local chieftain fell in love with the fairy bride who came out of uh, Tully Lock to marry him and they had three kids. But however, when he was unfaithful to her, she went back into the lake with three children and all his sheep. So he was left mourning for that. This would have been, I suppose, a legend in the local folklore, and this would have been going back to the 1600s. Loch Holly. Gar on Corrish Shkrech on Gay Ian, on Hranog, Lar and Locha, Farhin and Tauri, Tichim Gamal or McKenna in a Hashlan Uignach or Vroch and Locha. We lay in a kino of raw is a chlinia, he is swing kippakur. Neil fog ege, ach fad na fadoige, megalon vion an air, shkrech on gay eyein, is plobbernock na gark ishke, on divi in a fwilail heart air, jora a chin a deska a loch and vron ege, tully loch. The cranes crank. The wild goose scrake from beyond a cranog in mid lake. Summer rain spits on McKenna, desolate chief in a fortified home, withered by grief for his wife and their care, a household under froth and foam. Nothing left to him now but the plover's two lee, the snipe's scap, the moorhen's gurgly, and that wild goose scrake cormorants circling over him a torrent of tears spluttering into Sorrow Lake. Um, I will continue on and read um, the title poem, which is the talk of the town and in Irish that is Cugernach. Uh, so important to say that some of the translations are not literal translations. However, they do carry across the rhythm and sometimes even transform the poem. Cogernach. Um, just to explain, this is about the experience of being a woman, and that's important in this collection, the talk of the town, and how exhausting that can be sometimes. Cogernach. Urintha tertium de vehem of van, then tor no de nyavarj a yantararum, tertium de nkurgil de ruddy de hira gludu, irium tertiuk de skahain. The Hulia, the Thrakig and Chi, and Sheer Lorig Sadorigidus, Tertium de Clevon Ian, Jenarun, Jen Anacht, Tertiach de Maig, de Machuj Gruige, de Mingene, de Machim, is de Magach Roman Hain. And Peter Fallon has done a wonderful job with the translation here, I feel. I'm very privileged to have been. Um, published by the Gallery Press also. So big thanks to the, them. 
the talk of the town. From time to time, I just get tired of being a woman. The cuts to the chase I have to put up with. And then, in attention, I tire of constant pretendings, charades of the concealment of things. I grow tired of mirrors and endless looking on, stares and searches when the light's gone. I tire of clap traps and mist nets, of biding my time and of secrets. I'm tired of how my face feels and my fingertips, my hair, my waist, my very hips. Um, so there are many other poems in that collection about the experience of growing up along the border and um, place name poems also. However, I think I will perhaps uh, finish on a poem um, that was published in Irish Pages, and that's about a local place name called Derna Shalag. Derna Shalag, which means the oak wood of the hunting, but a lot of the Irish trace place names are just translated into the same sounds. So Derna Der Shalag becomes Derna Shalag. Derna Shalag. Rahime Shias good Derna Shalag. Ach me mahra. Fui hiver crave, be jarchan, fui costis kenach, a lar na kilakura, kira kulin cro gazula, go farshing on, bioler gasua, inglan hio, flourisha in a vlursha on, fiana, a rehen, a remena, a stav sahil, and we hear na kyo sahil, bulim which lenner dive she hin, lihim which fin cran kirhen on, a gaystock le munaver and trohan. Is crave vor agus crave kahna crave ke tamalon spare bin gohan smoli ar vara crave on bin gut na kuhia is an lin thu goshe na goshe on deliver fuin is luke rig abaraglun elo imuj on don shall elo imuj uin fein elar na kila kro gusula gafarshing on bioler gusuing lantio. Shani kyold a cool and free store, nor rahi much she is good there in the shallog, the kivas girlay, thought kinoch we cuss in there in the shallog, marilian much we kiver crave, in there in the shallog, but vrijach shime, is lan me magra, mar elich the kyo. So, this is a love poem about going down to the wood of the hunting, which is the translation of the place name, there in the shallog, there in the shallog, there in the shallog. I will go down to there in the shallog, the oak wood of the hunting, down to where my love will be under the gloom of the branches. There will be acorns underfoot and moss in the middle of the fragrant wood, holly berries, nuts and apples, in plenty there, cress and sorrel, in the mist glen, plentifulness there, and deer running in leaps, and a stag out in the wood mist. We'll meet our own ghosts there. We lie a while under the rowan tree, listening to the stream's murmur, rain showers through the branches, a while from the sky. The thrush's voice will be sweet there from the top of every branch, and sweet the cuckoo, sweet the blackbird, greenness there beneath us, leaves and rushes up to our knees. We'll escape from the world a while, escape from ourselves in the middle of the fragrant wood, holly berries, nuts and apples, in plenty there and sorrel in the mist glen. The music of your eye will play in my heart, love, when you go, you go down to Derna Shallog, the wood of the hunting, at dusky evening time. There's moss underfoot in Derna Shallog, where we lie under the shade of branches. In Derna Shallog, I was a fairy bride, and I followed my love like a doe in the mist. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed reading those poems, especially the last one, which is about a place named very near in this area of County Monaghan, North County Monaghan, Emmy Vale, and there are a lot of oak woods here, are there? So thank you very much. Now, our final poet is Laura Tohi, um, and Laura was named the Navajo Nation Poet Laureate in 2015, and is the second person ever in history to hold the title. Um, Laura grew up speaking both English and Navajo, but didn't study Navajo writers at school and wasn't allowed to speak Navajo at school. Um, but now she has a doctorate degree in creative writing 
um, Indigenous American Literature and American Literature. She's published several books, uh, including bilingual texts in both English and Navajo, and her poetry is award winning. So she'll read her poetry first in English and then again in Navajo, the original. Um, I hope you enjoy her selection of her work. My name is Laura Tohi and I'm the Navajo Nation Poet Laureate. My homeland lies within the states of Arizona, New Mexico, and a little bit into southern Utah in the southwestern part of the United States. I was raised on the Navajo homeland by storytellers and poets, which I didn't really know until I grew up. When I was a young girl growing up, I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know how one became a writer. All the writers that I had, whose work I had read were not Native, and it wasn't until much later I read works by Native American writers. And so these poems that I've written come from my family, come from the way I grew up, things that I have experienced. And because I grew up in a rich oral tradition, that was my first way of me getting into writing. So I'm very grateful to my family and for the stories that they told me as I was growing up. You know, while I, life is just really was about one story after another, we were always telling stories, telling jokes, and even in our ceremonies, we have these beautiful long prayers that are poems in itself too. So those were things that I, were around me and I really started to realize and appreciate later on in my life. Those are the things that have influenced me. And because our languages are in danger of extinction, it's even more important to try to keep the language alive and to use it and to vitalize it. I'm going to read two poems to you. The first one is in the English language and the second one is in the Navajo language. About this poem, I was at an exhibit in Portland, Oregon a few years ago, and I was looking at what looked like a large sandbox with various shapes and sizes of stones in it. And it looked like somebody or someone was leading them away. And this reminded me of the disappearance of animals and what's happening to the planet. So I wrote this poem and it's uh, called Japanese Garden. After a stone and sand exhibit in Portland. A man is leading the animals. A man is leading the ones that float on water. A man is leading the winged ones. A man is leading the ones that swim. Maybe he's St. Francis, the long-robed man who calls the animals to him now. Maybe he's Noah, the one who gathered the animals and sailed away with them, they say. Who was there to witness their leaving, to sing a song for their journey? Where are they going? Their faces turn northward, taking their songs, taking their maps, taking their languages. Are they leaving with joy in their hearts or a sadness eating at their star hearts? In the wake of their leaving, a small wind stirs the empty hands of the tree branches above us. What I will remember, footsteps, left like dinosaur tracks, pressed between Sky Woman and Mother Earth. When they leave, I will weep. I will weep. Yat e shilora tohi inishye, Navajo Nation Poet Laureate nishle. Tsana bilti nishle do tworich itni bashish chin. Johanna e tworlana dasha che doma i deshki jni dasha nala. Di sa tradadin wal yehgi ishla Japanese da ake yajate wolye. Portland de tsedotlej danil inigi. Huskin leyten alt loshi yo ish. Huskin leyten da ehligi yo ish. Huskin leyten da da agi yo ish. Huskin leyten da alt kongi yo ish. St. Francis da tsuat e. Be eight na shode. Hast ging die jene nille, jene. 
Kadhagoshan Yadil I'm going to read the English version of Meeting the Spirit of Water. When I was growing up, my paternal grandmother partly raised me. And during the summer, when I would take walks with her, she told me about spirit. And she said, the water has spirit and it has intelligence. And she said, when you meet water, you have to acknowledge it and it will acknowledge you. And in that way, it won't harm you. So this poem is for her, Meeting the Spirit of Water for Glenn Tohey. When you come to a river or lake or pond, one you haven't met, you must meet its spirit Place your hand into its belly, feel the energy, stroke its power, caress the life source. Let it run through your hands. Say a prayer. You must meet its spirit and it will never steal you, was what she told us as children. I'm going to read the Navajo version of Meeting the Spirit of Water. Tosi yiki, beta jaraco, inda a hijil seco, be inna ba quesne zenle, tuan se kes be holo, be inna ba quesne zengo, inna at ege, ush be ho zenle, tropi inche delni, sota zen be a geni, be inna bis a hijil seh. Okoto nitano ilta. Alchiniage than it lineta di beta nikit nestra. Thank you everyone for watching and a huge thanks to our three guest speakers. Um, I'm delighted we could have you on board and hear some of your poetry. Um, I really hope all of you at home enjoyed the selection of work that we've heard today. And if you did, then do please let us know because we'd love to hear it. Um, and you can sign up to the poetry mailing list um, if you want to be notified about everything poetry related that happens at home stage in the future.